Okay, we'll begin. Uh, just before we went for our break, we were looking at the importance of uh, explaining uh, or, uh, you know, mentioning theological truths when we are teaching children um, narratives or stories from the Bible, not just mention uh, the story or narrative, but bring out deeper theological truths which they can, uh, you know, receive, which they can learn and uh, they can grow in the things of God, okay? Uh, another thing that you need to remember when writing your lesson plan is plan relevant class activities and illustrations. We've already spoken about that when we talked about um, uh, auditory learners and visual learners. So it's important that you have your visual aids, either puppets or posters, pictures, or you can do a small drama, you can enact. When you are speaking, it's important that you have voice modulation, um, eye contact, keep looking at children. You know, if I want to, uh, especially when I teach in schools or when I teach children, you know, if one child is not listening and I know they're dreaming, they're playing with something or they're disturbing the class, I just keep looking at them. And I keep looking at them, they freeze, and then they are listening. So I don't waste time in correcting them or I don't want to pull them up and, you know, make them feel awkward. But just looking at them saying, when I'm teaching them, telling them, hey, I'm looking at you. I know what you're doing. I want you to listen. So just my eye contact, my facial expressions, important, and hand gestures, movements. All is very important. You just can't stand and, you know, like when you preach, you can't just stand uh, uh, in one place and preach. But for two children, you will have to um, come down to their level. You need to make all kind of faces, noises, you know, acting, whether it will sound, it looks silly, but for them it will not. For the younger ones especially, uh, you know, it will just help. So it is important that you use visual aids and use relevant class activities and illustrations because children hear only 10% uh, 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 children, you know, um, receive only 10% of what they hear or children retain only 10% of what they hear, 30% of what they see, okay? So if 30% of, which means hearing and seeing happens, information is retained in the mind. So 10% of what they hear, 30% of what they see, 50% of what they hear and see, 70% of what they hear, see and say, which means, you know, you're asking them questions, you're getting, um, uh, you're stopping, you're posing questions, you're having some discussion, or you're throwing a case scenario, asking them to, you know, uh, to share their viewpoint. So children learn 70% of what they hear, see, and say, and children hear 90% or retain 90%, sorry, they retain 90% of what they hear, see, say, and do, okay? So if they're just hearing, it's only 10%, 30% when they see, 50% they hear and see, 70% of they hear, see, and say, 90% of what they hear, see, say, and do, okay? So, so important for you to get them to, uh, you know, uh, ask questions so that you get back information and you're hearing back from them and you know that they have caught the truth, they have they have uh, understood what you're teaching them, others you can teach them again, reiterate it if they're not caught it. And then, you know, 90% uh, of what they hear, see, say and do. So also activities, object lessons, get them to enact and things like that. So get children to be actively involved in your class. So when you're writing down the lesson plan, you can look at various instances in your um, uh, in your time that you're going to teach and say, okay, let me throw a, a, a question here. <coughs> Sorry. Let me ask them a question or um, um, I can, you know, just have a discussion question here for a couple of minutes or I can give them a case scenario and get to know how much they've really understood um, and see whether they can apply what truth or concept I have uh, taught them, okay? So, 
uh, when uh, get them involved because when you uh, have active class participation and activities and your young ones are involved uh, and there's participatory learning that is happening then there is more enthusiasm you know and children will learn more and retain more okay and it's also important that you hear them say what you have thought because you know simply presenting information uh, does not guarantee that you know children have caught everything they have learned everything um, you know and that they are listening to you that is why it's important that you take time after you present a, a truth or concept or you're teaching them a theological truth or a main truth uh, that is presented to them you check their understanding okay so when you're writing out a lesson plan you can think of various places where you can stop and ask them a question uh, to see if they understood what you have taught them. And uh, once you have written out this entire thing, then you will know that, you know, hey, my lesson is pretty big. Uh, you need two classes to finish. In that case, you can remove some unimportant things, things that are not important, or you can stretch it to two classes and you can uh, know where you are going to stop in your story. So come to a climax in your story, a conclusion, what is the application? So, you know, they're not just left hanging in midair for them to come back next year, uh, sorry, next week and, you know, uh, uh, get the learning and application and practice it, but they're already going to begin to do that even as you've completed half of the uh, lesson plan, okay? So that is another important thing why you need to write out your lesson and uh, the last thing that uh, i would like to uh, uh, you know just uh, help us with is how to tell a bible story okay uh, children love to listen to stories so that is why if you look at most of our lesson plans even if it is biblical doctrines or biblical covenants or uh, it's about sin and salvation or it is about uh, um, you know, uh, 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 evangelism, you know, every lesson will have at least a Bible story, with, you know, because children can connect to uh, uh, stories, to narratives. We, uh, and we also, of course, uh, use Bible passages, but we, we basically use a story because that is what uh, catches their attention. Okay, so it's important that you narrate a story well uh, so that you can capture their attention. Okay, and a, a Bible story is a narrative of events and actions, so you need to bring out those events and actions. And um, so, the beginning of the story is very, very important. I've already uh, told you in the introduction how to introduce your lesson. But uh, just about a story, there are four main ways you can begin a story, okay? Uh, but if you discover more than four ways of what I am presenting now and telling you is okay, uh, don't hesitate to uh, use them. You can use them. Uh, so to teach us how to narrate a story, I would uh, like to use the story of uh, 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 the narrative in 1 Kings chapter 21, the story about Naboth's uh, vineyard. Is there PowerPoints are there? Uh, story of Naboth's uh, vineyard, okay? So the first uh, way that you can, uh, I'm not saying it's the first way, but one of the ways that you can begin a story is a direct approach, okay? Uh, you can start with a uh, direct approach means you can start with the action of the story, the main action point of the uh, story, okay? Uh, you can uh, think of several sentences which will basically capture the attention of the young ones. Now, for example, in a direct approach uh, for this narrative on, uh, uh, you know, the story of Naboth's vineyard, you can tell the children, you know, it was just a vineyard, children. All of you know what is the meaning of a vineyard. And then you can explain what's the vineyard. And uh, you can tell them, you know, this king wanted this vineyard. Now, you might be mind wondering why a king wants a vineyard, you know, when he owns the whole country and he has so much of property. Why does he want this vineyard? 
you see, this vineyard was right beside his summer palace. So it was summer and he was in the summer palace and he was walking on his balcony. So just imagine you're the king, you know, and, <clears throat> you know, you're walking on this uh, in the balcony and you see this beautiful green vineyard with beautiful green or uh, black grapes hanging and they're looking so delicious. And you're thinking, hey, this, you know, is just next to my my palace, what if I own this vineyard? Okay, so uh, the king thought about it and he thought about it, but you see, he had a problem. Now, the children will be wondering now, what is the problem? So, you see how you're getting them to think and getting them engaged, and you know, the way you're saying it, but you see, you know, the king had a problem. Uh, what was the problem? Anyone knows what was the problem? You know, so the children be thinking. They might say some smart ones can say the interpersonal um, children. You know, who learn intelligence, they will answer. Uh, you know, the the vineyard did not belong to him. You know, so uh, this is a good way of starting with a direct approach, and then you can go on with the rest of the story. Of course, the narrative. So when you're teaching um, a narrative or a story which is well known to children. Don't give out the names of the main character in the very beginning. Say, I didn't care. say it was King Nabal, uh, King Ahab. I didn't say it was Naboth's vineyard. Because what happens is, uh, you know, when you tell them a familiar story, which they all know, then you say, I know it, and they'll not be interested. They'll keep interrupting. They'll say, it's a boring story, uh, 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 teacher or ma'am or auntie. Can you tell us some other story? then you'll have a lot of problems, okay? So just like my teacher, remember in VBS I told you, he he told us a story about the five loaves and two fishes and we couldn't catch it till the end. So you keep them guessing and you keep them, you know, uh, interested in your uh, narrative, okay? The second way you can, or another way that you can um, begin a story is through the question method, okay? You can ask a question which is related um, to the beginning of the narrative or you know or you can ask a question related to the main truth that you're trying to teach them through the narrative okay but it should not be something that is really boring like for example how many of you um you know want to have a big vineyard now children will not even want to have a vineyard okay how many of you want a big land nobody will be interested in a land children especially okay so you need to phrase your question based on their interests and um, their felt needs so what do you think will be a good question for uh, this narrative to get their attention any thoughts any ideas What's a good question you can ask? Hello, class. Everybody there in class? Ask them whether they need toy toy cars. Yes. <laughs> can ask them whether they need toy cars. Yes, good, Paul. Thank you. Yes, whatever age group that you are teaching them, you can, instead of directly asking them, hey, do you like to have toy cars or do you like to have this or that? You can ask them as, of course, how many of you like to have mobiles or, you know, new PlayStation or, you know, whatever is uh, their interest in their age group. Or you can just ask them, is there something that you really like to have? You know, if, you, if I ask any of us here also, there are so many things we really like to have. So, you know, children will be very excited because... Yeah, there's so many things that they really like to have and somebody's asking them because nobody really asked them you know because they know their parents know if they really ask them then they'll have hands full they won't ask them so you know uh, you can ask them this question and they'll all be super excited so you need to have classroom control you know um, uh, and get uh, know a good way to handle them but get everyone's answers and get them involved so they will all like to tell you and so you can say you know hey um, um, I'm going to tell you about a person, you know, uh, who had so many nice things, but there is something that he really wanted to 
have. So they'll be thinking, who is this person who has so many things and what does he really want to have? And so they'll be listening to your story because you are starting from their felt need. They also want something. They also want those that something that they want. They want to get it. So they're going to listen to you. Okay. Now, for example, if you're teaching them about David and Goliath, or you're teaching about um, uh, Zacchaeus, um, what is the question that you can ask them? What's the question you can ask them? A simple question. Any thoughts? All of you in class? But can you ask them a question for Zacchaeus or David and Goliath's story? Maybe I will ask them who's the tallest boy in the class and who's the shortest. And I'll have them come up in front and I will tell them that, you know, the tallest uh, boy will ask, or the tallest person will ask them, you know, uh, what, what do they like about being tall? Or what is the advantages of being tall? And I'll ask the short person if they like being short, and what is the advantage of being short? And I would tell them that when I was in school, I was the shortest uh, girl in school. I started in an all-girls school. And, uh, you know, I was the shortest, so I would have the privilege of standing right up in front, sitting right up in front, and all my classmates would rear, my friends, would, my close friends would be really angry with me. And, you know, on, on sports day, we used to, you know, make these human pyramids, you know, so all of the huge big ones. I remember Jean, Jean was my classmate uh, in school. And Jean would be right down because she's really tall. She'd be right down and, you know, people would, and all of the others would be on them, you know, and I would climb right up in front and I would have to stand like this, you know, with my hands out and everybody will clap and they will say, hey, Serena, get down, get down fast. Are, my back is fading, my hand is fading. And they'll say, only when you get up, you get all the recognition and the honor and, you know, everybody's clapping and look at us. We are like donkeys, you know, carrying you or the base. Uh, on the base here and so you know um we used to have so much of fun so uh you know being short was uh, uh um, you know had his own advantages so i would tell children that um so you know children will relate that they have some weaknesses in them you know but how they can overlook that weaknesses and look at the advantages that they have in their weaknesses so you can um you know, start with a question method, or you can also start with an exciting part of the story. An exciting part of the story is like a flashback approach, you know, where you begin with an outstanding part of the narrative, somewhere in the middle or somewhere in the end, and then you get back to the beginning of that narrative or story and tell them how it all came about. So for this narrative on uh, Naboth, uh, Naboth's vineyard, um, you know, what is the exciting part of the story? Now, children like, like to have lots of everything, right? So, uh, and, you know, they like to have everything in abundance, lots of toys, lots of food, lot of snacks, lot of chocolates. So, you know, if I'm teaching the younger ones or even the older ones, they would like more clothes, more shoes, uh, you know, and all of those things. So I say, you know, this person had lots and lots of money. He could buy anything and everything that he wanted. He just had to clap his hands. The servants would bring him water and food, bring his shoes, you know, whatever he wanted. And he used to eat the best food. He lived in the best house in the land. And, you know, you know who this person is? So they'll say some multimillionaire and all of those things. And he was a king. And then you can say, hey, you, you know, if you're a king, you'd expect the king to be happy, right? Because he has everything and anything that he once. But look at this king. You know, this king is sulking on his bed. He's just sleeping. He's sulking. He doesn't want to talk to anybody. 
And in those days when the king is upset or sad or crying, everybody in the palace will cry and sulk and be upset and sad. If the king doesn't eat, nobody eats. If the king is crying, everybody cries. If the king is sulking, everybody sulks. So everybody was sulking and the queen was wondering why the king had not come for lunch and what's wrong? Why is everybody sulking? So she goes to his room and she sees him sulking and says, what's wrong? What happened? Why are you sulking? Tell me what happened. So the king was very, very upset about something and he was sulking about it. And so he tells the queen why he is sulking. Do you want to know why he was sulking? And then you go back to the beginning of the narrative. So you begin with some exciting part of the story and then you get back to the uh, uh, to the main part of the story, okay? And then also you have illustration. You can begin the story with an illustration. Um, I have a good real life uh, incident, a scenario for the same illustration um, uh, that illustrates this neighbor's vineyard, you know, about um, yeah, uh, uh, here in, in, in India, we have a very famous uh, a snack uh, uh, company called Haldi Rams. It's called Haldi Rams, and uh, you know uh, uh, they have a lot of variety of snack items which they sell. And uh, this Haldi Rams, they had a, they have a factory just outside um, uh, 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 an airport in uh, in India, which is called a place called Kolkata, Calcutta. You know, uh, just outside the airport. So when you come out of that airport, you know, you can smell all of these uh, snack items that they make. And just next to this uh, Haldi Rams factory was a vacant plot of land. So the 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 owner thought it's a, a good thing to extend his a good land to extend his factory. So he asked his manager to find out, you know, who's the owner. And to his surprise, he found out that the, the owner was um, uh, the person who was selling tea. He had a small tea shop there and he was selling tea and he was the owner. So the, the, the Haldiram's owner, uh, the factory owner was shocked because he thought this man was just an ordinary, you know, person who was selling, making tea. But he's the owner of that land and to own a land in a place like uh, Calcutta uh, is, you know, is really big. Uh, because land value is very, very high, like in Mumbai and, you know, other places in uh, in India. So um, he sent his manager and he said, you know, he would like to buy that land and to quote his price and he will give him whatever he asked. So the 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 uh, tea shop owner said, no, he can't sell that land because he's got it. He's an ancestral property. He can't sell it, just like the, the Bible one, Naboth, you know, he can't sell it. So um, Haldiram's owner was very, very upset. He said, you know, he tried to buy him in. He said he'll give him prime property in the city, you know, which will be for crores of rupees, worth double and more. But um, the uh, the landowner, the tea stall owner, just wouldn't budge. He would just not give his property or sell his property for anything. And the Haldiram's factory owner was so mad, he got um, some goons to kill him and get away with him and he took uh, he took over that property and that land and uh, you know um, I read this in the newspaper so I was telling children this and you know um, uh, finally they caught the person who they happened to catch the person who uh, murdered uh, this tea stall owner and when they interrogated him finally led to the manager of Haldiram's factory and then the manager said that it was the owner who, who planned all of these things and then you know the owner was put behind bars so you know a good illustration to start off for the older ones and you know you can go on with your story but keep it very short and sweet but for the or you can use you know another illustration you can say you know there were these two friends if they're most of them are boys in your class or girls in your class you have to be use illustration based on the number of students uh, uh, the, you know male or female students you have so just think you have more boys in your class you can say you know um, uh, uh, you know john and paul had uh, you know uh, cricket bats and john got a new latest cricket bat um, and Paul really liked John's bat and every time they would go to play he would not use his bat but he would use John's bat and he would always think of how 
you know, he could get John's bat. And he tried asking his mom to buy it. He tried asking his dad to buy it. But they said, you already have a nice bat. That's too expensive. They can't afford it. But, you know, it's something that he kept thinking and kept thinking and kept thinking about how to get that bat. Okay, so you can ask his children, is there something that you also really want that some of your, you know, your friends have and all of them would think and then you can start off with your uh, story. Okay, or you can also use uh, one of um, the good beginnings for your, uh, uh, for your narrating a story is also using an object lesson. Now, once you're done with the beginning, you move on with the progression of events okay which is the main part of the narrative so you uh, kind of list out in sequence the events that happened in the story so it's important that you uh, you know uh, uh, like uh, like jafina told us uh, last class that it's important that you you know follow the the sequence or order of the story so that you don't miss out anything the progression of events uh, one leading to the next uh, so that you don't get sidetracked to talking about some things that are unrelated into the narrative and you just keep the lesson. So what is the progression of events to the lesson in Nabot's uh, cover, uh, cover, covets Nabot's video? asked Naboth for it and uh, Naboth refuses to s for some other plot of land. Um, Ahab sulks, uh, Je Jezebel writes killed. King Ahab, you can go and take the vineyard. When he goes to the vineyard, he meets Elijah who you know, uh, pronounces a curse and tells him that God has seen what he has done and this is the consequence of the punishment for his sin, okay? So you have the list of events that help you to clearly move on. Others, if you forget, uh, you know, we are all human. We forget some part of the story and, you know, for children to go back and come back, it's very difficult for them to relate. For adults, it's easier. So it's important that you write down the... A sequence uh, of the narratives, the progression of events, so you can follow through easily. And then you come to the climax. Okay. So the climax is the highest point of the story. All of your events leading to, uh, it's here where you're telling them whether the hero wins or loses, unsolved, how okay. And you're getting actually the young ones to the peak of uh, the interest and you're satisfying their curiosity here, the suspense of the anxiety and, you know, you're untangling the plot that you are narrated to them so far. So in this narrative, what do you think is the climax? What is the climax of the story of Naboth's vineyard? What do you think it can be? What's the climax for Naboth's vineyard? Not to covet others. Okay, not to covet others. That is maybe your main teaching point. Maybe your main uh, 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 truth that you're trying to say. But climax is basic where you are taking them to, you know, about the story which you're telling them. You know, it's uh, getting them to the peak of their interest, whether, you know, whether the hero wins or loses, the problem is solved or not solved, or the mystery ends. So what do you think is the climax in this story? No, no problem, Rosalind. Thank you for trying. Good to hear some voice at least. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, Jeffina says meeting Elijah. Okay, yes. That's part of the climax. What is the climax of the story? What does Elijah tell uh, King Ahab? The climax can, of the story can be, you know, of course, Naboth got the vineyard. But what does Elijah tell him? 
you know, tells him where Naboth died, you will also die. Okay, so that is the climax. So the children want to know, did King Ahab really die in the same place that Naboth died? Okay, so then that leads you to the conclusion. Okay, now... <clears throat> Some stories are very long. You will need to tell them in parts. So even in the parts that you're saying, you can bring the whole uh, narrative to a climax. Okay, so the climax here is the, the punishment that Elijah speaks on behalf of God to King Ahab. Now, what is the conclusion? Okay, the conclusion comes soon after the climax. Okay, so, um, you know, uh, it's the ending of the, basically, conclusion is basically ending of the, story. So what do you think is the ending of the story in Naboth's vineyard? Think of the climax and then think of the conclusion. What's the conclusion of the story? Okay, what is the climax? Climax was what punishment that King, uh, that, uh, you know, Elijah had pronounced on. King Ahab. So what do you think will be the conclusion of the story? Ahab? Realizing what he has done, okay. What is the conclusion of the story? The abuse of power and consequences of greed and injustice, okay. Yes. So in this case, the uh, conclusion is, you know, did King Ahab and Queen Jezebel meet their punishment and their, uh, you know, the consequences of their sin that God had spoken through <coughs> Elijah, okay? So then you can go on to say in your conclusion that Ahab went for a battle, he disguised himself, the enemy did not know that he was a king and struck an arrow and then he died and... Um, Sometime later, Jezebel was thrown down by the enemies from the window. So what God said would happen to them did happen. Okay, did it happen? Okay, yes. So it happened. Now, what is the use of Naboth's vineyard? There was no use because they could not enjoy it because they were dead. So then you can talk about greed and all of those things and the consequences of greed. Okay, so... You know, uh, you can. this can be the conclusion to your climax. Now, often we're very happy when we have, you know, told our story well. We've used object lessons. We've used discussions. We've used uh, a good attention getter or illustration. We've narrated our story. We've caught them to the climax and the conclusion. We've done everything that we needed to do. But the important thing is that, you know, have the children caught the truth. It's not the story that is important. It's not your, uh, you know, just the, the 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 methods that you've used. All of those are yes are important, but have they caught the important truth, the truth, the values that they have to learn and apply it in their lives. So the next one is application. Okay, so application is you know don't be vague about the application. Don't say okay, children. You look at you. You see from Naboth's vineyard how we learn not to be greedy, and you see how you know if you're greedy, you know we can have consequences. So we should not uh, be greedy. Well, of course that is an application that you can use, but you need to get them to apply it in their own lives. So you can tell them, you know, children, what are the areas that you are greedy, where you want more and more and more. Maybe you want more and more time to play when you have to spend more time in studying and doing your project work. Or you want more and more clothes when you have so much more and, you know, you can give away those clothes to some other children or you can be thankful for what you have or you want more and more of shoes, more and more of chocolate or you're eating more and more of junk food and what is the consequences. So, you know, get them to apply it in their own context because uh, for everyone, it will not just be greed for money or land or property, but be different things. So get them to list them out the areas where they're greedy because sometimes children will think, hey, I'm not greedy in any area. So then you will help them to have to help them to think 
you know, because they're children, they can't think, you know, so you can say, maybe you're greedy about wanting more chocolates or, you know, eating more junk food or watching more cartoons uh, on TV or entertainment or more time for playing, you know, all of those things are a form of greed, which they might not know, but you'll have to help them. And so you get them to write out all of those things and, uh, you know, uh, uh, get them to see how they can help themselves to overcome that greed. Okay, so it might be personally just relating to each child, even as the others are writing and say, "Hey, can I see what your greed is? Can I help you?" And what the Bible says and how they can overcome that greed. So it's basically helping them. So you see, at a very young age, you're not teaching them that greed is going to destroy their lives, but also that you're teaching them uh, to identify the greed in their life and how to work on uh, it. So don't let your application be very vague, like say, hey, children, all of us have to, if you're talking about obedience, all of us have to obey God. All of us have to obey our teachers, our parents. Yes, but what are the areas they are struggling in obeying their parents and how you can help them out? Okay, and then of course you can uh, teach them the memory verse for that day and you can do creative ways of teaching them the memory verse. You can have the memory verse written on the board and ask them to repeat it thrice and each time you can rub, erase a word and put a fill in a blank there. And so they have to keep saying the whole memory verse and so they just remember it. Finally, there are no words on the board, just blank spaces. Or you can take a, 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 a soft ball and you can just throw it at one child and they have to say, uh, you know, if you say teaching them God so loved the world, so they can say two words, God so, and they throw the ball to another person and that the person said, God so loved the, and then the third person, God so loved the world that, you know, so then, you know, each child gets turns or they have to move from one chair to another and, you know, they move to the next chair, they have to say one word in the memory verse. Can you think of various creative ways? There are numerous creative ways of teaching children uh, memory verse rather than just getting them to memorize it. And of course, then you end with a prayer. Prayer also should not be something that is very general. God, help us not to be greedy, help us to obey. Uh, we know that greed destroys uh, us. We know that greed hurts you. But get them to specifically pray. So you can say, children, you've written down areas where you need, you're need you disobeying. Uh, you're finding it dis uh, difficult to obey. Areas where you're greedy. Areas where uh, <clears throat> there is sin, when you're talking about sin. So just quietly tell God, God, these are the areas I want you to help me. Please help me. Ask the Holy Spirit to come, help you. Say, God, I give up these areas into your hands. So lead them. Lead them, you know, and get them to uh, pray and, uh, you know, um, and um, uh, pray more meaningfully than more uh, generally. And then that can, that will end your lesson. Okay. So this is how you write a lesson plan and this is how you execute your lesson plan and these are the various things that you can keep in mind while uh, writing a lesson plan okay so that is the end of um, children's ministry course uh, anyone has any questions any doubts anything you'd like to say ask Nothing. Anything you think I need, I should have thought and missed out. Maybe I can think about it for the next uh, time I teach other students. Okay, I think nobody wants to talk. <laughs> Thank you, Subhashish. <coughs> Okay, I hope uh, this um, course was helped you in children's ministry and I hope you will implement all that uh, we've learned and, uh, you know, to teach your own children and also uh, to get your uh, children's church ministers uh, to minister effectively to children and to build on your uh, uh, children's ministry in church. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Paul, John Paul. Um, 
so when can we have, we, I have to give you another assessment. When can we have, uh, thank you, Zelatoli. Thank you, Subhashish. When can we have our next assessment? I have to give you another assessment. Now, this Thursday, 7th, is your assessment on 1st and 2nd Timothy. Can you suggest any day in March? Or if you want me to give you the assessment for your second assessment, final assessment for children's ministry? Can you please suggest a date? Any date in March? Maybe April can be a little uh, hectic for you all, so we'll do it in March. Thank you, Abdul Baker. As soon as possible, okay. Can you suggest a date, please? Is 14th of March okay? No? Oh, they are going for their mission trip, the in person students. What about 21st March? Is 21st March okay for all of you? 21st March is Thursday. Is that okay? Yes, okay, fine. Okay, uh, 21st March, we'll have uh, the, the last assessment uh, for uh, children's ministry. And uh, next week onwards, um, Pastor Roshan Joannis will take on children's ministry. Thank you, Lyndon. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, and I'll see you for our classes on 1st and 2nd Timothy. Okay.